All right, it is exactly six o'clock and we've got a busy, busy schedule and lots of people who have joined us. So I'm going to get this uh, event started right now. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us um, and talk about uh, our favorite subject, cutaneous oncology, anything having to do with cancers arising from the skin. I'm Dr. Vernon Sondak. I'm the chair of the Department of Cutaneous Oncology and a surgical oncologist. And I know quite a few of you are even on this call today, and I'm excited to see all of you. I'm excited to have you get to meet um, some people that you might not necessarily see uh, in our clinic every day and uh, uh, share some of the exciting discoveries that are going on that have helped to fuel a revolution in the management of skin cancers, including melanoma. But before we start, there's always some uh, important information we have to convey. This content is not intended to be official medical advice, and you should consult your physician if you have any questions. The uh, uh, people viewing this should not rely on the information contained in this presentation for immediate or urgent medical needs. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency room or dial 911 and never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of something you saw in this presentation. So having said that, again, we are so delighted to have you with us tonight. Um, I want to remind everyone in the audience that this is intended to be an interactive session. We will have time set aside for questions, and you will all have the opportunity to um, put questions up for discussion by typing them into the Q&A section, not the chat function, but the Q&A function, and just type in your questions. I'm going to be um, keeping track of them, trying to group them into categories, and trying to make sure that we answer the questions from every category that we possibly can. Okay, and uh, uh, I'm going to make a few remarks about the people at, in the cutaneous program and the people that we take care of and what the future holds. I've been at Moffitt since 2004. This is one of the earlier pictures of our whole team from 2007. I just like to show this to show how we've grown. This is a picture uh, in 2020 in our new clinic over here at McKinley. And three years later, there's even more of us here um, with a new surgeon just starting a few months ago, new oncologists, new dermatologists. We've continued to grow lots and lots of new nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. And why have we grown? Because the volume of people that we've had to care for has grown. And the number of places that we've had to care for them has had to grow as well. We're really excited that at the end of July, we opened our new Moffitt McKinley Hospital attached to our McKinley Outpatient uh, Center by this beautiful bridge across McKinley Boulevard. I just walked across it earlier this evening to uh, to visit one of my patients in there. A big shout out to him. He's recovering from surgery, but he promised he'd be on the webinar. And uh, uh, I also want to point out that this small uh, four or five story building behind the McKinley outpatient building is our cell therapy facility. Um, in, where we manufacture tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and other uh, products for cancer treatment that came right from the patient's own uh, cells. We, we've been a leader in that. We expect to see uh, that kind of treatment become more and more common and potentially even FDA approved for commercial use uh, as, as soon as the next few months or a year. 
So we're growing here. We're growing everywhere. We're back to doing everything we like to do in cutaneous. One of the big things we like to do is the mole patrol. Get out and try to um, increase awareness about uh, the dangers of the sun and the importance of protecting yourself from the sun, but also the importance of early detection. We do free skin cancer screenings all across the state of Florida. The next one is November 18th at Amelie Arena as part of our Miles for Moffitt fundraiser. Uh, if you want information about Miles for Moffitt, that's on our website as well. And go on to the next slide. Again, I've talked about the growth in our hospital, in our number of doctors, nurses, and other uh, providers here. But the big issue is the growth in the number of cancer cases. And I wanted to show this um, slide. It's a complicated one. But this black dotted line is the expected incidence of melanoma. If nothing changes about the way we behave, about our use of tanning beds, about how we uh, uh, spend our time in the sun and whether we use sunscreen, if nothing changes, according to this study released just two years ago, melanoma will become the second most common major cancer type in the USA by 2040. That's only just over 16 years from now, and it'll be number one in men. We're hoping we can blunt this by getting the message out and telling people about the dangers of the sun, but there's no question that even if we can slow it, we can't stop this rise, and the number of people we need to take care of is going up, uh, the number of people who are survivors is going up, and we want the word to get out. And I also like to stress it's important for us and for this topic today is that what the Cancer Society considers a major cancer type doesn't even include the other skin cancers we take care of, basal and squamous cell cancers in particular. Together, all of those basal and squamous cell cancers are just about as common as every other type of cancer put together. So we could have a situation in a few years where the three of the four top cancers in the United States are skin cancers and only breast cancer is in that top four. So we've got a lot of work to do. Fortunately, there's been a huge amount of progress. Um, this slide shows the drugs that the FDA approved for melanoma between 1970 when they approved one in 1975, to 1990s, when they approved two different drugs, interferon and interleukin, to the 2000s and 2010 in particular is when it started. And since 2010, we've got all these new and incredibly powerful drugs. This only goes up to 2021. Since then, we've had additional new approvals of drugs for different indications and our first approvals for drugs for melanomas arising in the eye, uveal melanoma. And it's not just the drug companies that are getting uh, the benefit of all these drug approvals. Our patients are getting the benefits. The survival rate for metastatic melanoma is higher than it has ever been. And up to 60% of patients are living uh, at least five years after a diagnosis of melanoma. When I came here in 2004, less than 25% of patients survived one year after a diagnosis of metastatic melanoma. So that's an enormous, enormous change. We're very excited about it, but we want to do even better. 60% survival is great, but it's not 100%. But it does mean we've set the bar really high. That's one of the highest survivals for any kind of cancer once it has spread. And to get beyond that, and to get over such a high bar, it's going to take some new discoveries, some new clinical trials, and some new ideas. And that's what the rest of today is about. We're going to talk about some of the new ideas, the new technology, the new research that we're doing, and who better to start us off 
been my research colleague and partner for many years, Karen Smalley, the director of the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Center of Excellence. He's going to talk about how we are studying melanoma, not as a giant tumor, but actually looking at every single cancer cell and how they interact. So Kieran, take it away. Okay, thanks, Vern. So hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm gonna tell you about some of the exciting research that we have ongoing at the moment. And I'll explain to you how I, I think it could help improve therapy in future. So um, the thing we're really doing here is trying to look at a melanoma at a single cell level. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So here we have an example of a patient who has an acral melanoma here um, on, um, um, on their foot. And if you have a look at the histology of this lesion under um, a microscope, you can clearly see there's something here. This is where the tumor is. There are all kinds of cells in here, except until recently, we didn't really have a clear idea what kind of cells actually um, th that we had in here. It's possible that as well as having tumor cells in here, we have normal host cells. We have the, the fibroblasts that you have in your skin and things like that except more importantly, we have a lot of immune cells in here. And the um, immune cells are important because these are the cells which are needed if you are receiving an immunotherapy. So essentially how immunotherapies work is, is to basically turn on the activity of these um, immune cells, allowing them to come in, find an and really attack the cancer. So this is basically a really uh, clever approach where essentially after the, the, the tumor is surgically removed, we have a technique to split this up into each single cell that you see here. And then we look at the expression of the genes in each cell and, um, and from here, we're able to figure out what kind of cell each kind of um, individual is. Here is actually an overview of all of um, the cell types that we can find in a, a melanoma lesion. So you see we have large numbers of cells here, which are highlighted and described as being the melanoma cells. We have a large number of host cells too. So these are essentially the normal cells that you find in the skin. And then as well as that, we have many um, immune cells. And these can be things like the CD4 and the CD8 T cells, which are extremely important for um, the immune attack of the tumor. And also the key cells we're interested in activating when we treat a patient with immunotherapy. Next slide, please. And one thing we learned using these, um, these clever single cell approaches is that every patient's tumor is unique. So here I'm showing a whole series of uh, samples from um, individual patients here. So each kind of um, a bar here is taken from one individual patient. Everything in purple colored here is a, a tumor cell. These things shown in pale blue are the T cells. And then of course we have other um, immune cells too. And so the thing that you notice straight away is everyone looks completely unique. So for example, we have a, a sample here from a patient, it's nearly all purple. And the thing that that's telling us is it's mostly tumor cells here, we have very few um, immune cells infiltrating into it. We also have an example here of um, AM2 shown here, um, where you have very few tumor cells, it's mostly um, immune cells. And so um, really attempting to uh, figure out the kind of immune cells that each patient has in their tumor is important because we know if 
a melanoma has a certain kind of um, immune infiltrate, there could be an improved outcome. It could also mean the patient may be more responsive to immunotherapy, except what we're trying to actually do now is way more sophisticated than merely having a look at the kind of cells we have in each tumor. If you have a look over here, you see a, a circle and it has like an orange patch and green, blue, and pink and so on. Each of these is representing one of the kind of cells that we found in each individual's tumor. And you'll see arrows, which are kind of um, interacting between each of uh, the cell types. And really what we're exploring here is how the um, immune cells are communicating with the tumor cells, how the immune cells are speaking to each other and in turn, how, how the tumor cells are impacting the um, immune cells. It sounds highly complicated, except if we have some um, insights um, into how the immune cells interact with the tumor, particularly in patients who have a more favorable outcome, it will be possible for us in future to really fig figure out quite early on which patients will have improved outcomes and it will also allow us to actually find unique cell-cell interactions, which we will be able to exploit for new therapies in future. Next slide, please. Now, I showed you the all of the, these kind of um, immune cells and tumor cells. Now, the problem about the experiments I've already shown you is we basically start off having a piece of tumor and we blast it up into the single um, individual cells. So although we can tell you what kind of cells are there, we don't have a clear idea who is interacting with who. So this really brings me on to the latest area that we're focused on at the moment, which is really trying to look at the interactions of the tumor cells and immune cells in space. Now, this is important as really um, um, if we're seeing a patient who has a, a favorable outcome, they have a particular kind of um, immune cell there, we want to really know, is it interacting with a tumor? Is it interacting with other um, immune cells? And so here is why at the moment we're really focused on how the cancer cells and the immune cells are interacting in space. Next slide, please. And I'll show you an example of why we think this is important. So I've shown you two examples here. Uh, the first one is a specimen from a patient who had a relatively poor outcome. They had a surgery, the, the primary tumor had been removed and then the patient had recurred afterwards. Uh, the second example here had been a patient who had had a primary and a, a favorable um, outcome, and they had no evidence of the, the tumor actually recurring. And then the important thing here is to then have a look at the spatial interaction of the, the tumor cells and the um, immune cells from the patients who have the poor outcome compared to a favorable outcome as shown here. And clearly it's apparent that you can see far more happening in the patients who have this favorable outcome. You have many more um, immune cells here. And the thing we're working on at the moment is trying to work out how these immune cells are interacting with each other and how they're communicating. And this is very important because if we're able to thoroughly um, um, understand how this works, there'll be plenty of opportunities for coming up with new therapeutic strategies in future. Next slide, please. And so finally, I'm interested in showing you how th these kind of uh, single cell experiments, which are extremely complicated, as I'm sure that you can appreciate, are helpful in understanding how therapies work in turn, allowing us 
to come up with improved therapeutic strategies. So what you're seeing here is an experiment in a mouse, actually a series of mice. And um, these are basically um, mice which have a melanoma metastasis in their brains. So on the MRI I'm showing here, it's shown here um, in red. Now, this group of mice here are um, untreated. Our mice over here are treated with the FDA approved combination of anti-PD-1 and anti-HAG3, and you can see it works over time. You're not seeing as much tumor on the MRI, it's shrinking away. And these mice over here are, are treated with a combination of the anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4. And again, you can see the therapy is highly effective. Each mouse at the start has a tumor shown here in red and over time it's shrinking away. Except it was never really clear to us what population of immune cells these two FDA therapies were, FDA approved therapies were actually impacting. And so here we carried out a, a single cell RNA-seq experiment again. So, so basically after the mice here had been treated using the immunotherapy, we extracted the tumor, we ran our experiments on it and found there had been an influx of a certain kind of um, immune cells into the, uh, the mice treated with the PD-1 plus lag-3 that we had not seen in the mice who were treated with the PD-1 plus CTLA-4. And through these experiments, we were really able to have a very clear understanding of how each of these um, immunotherapies had had its um, effects. And as these experiments carry on, we expect to actually find new and important immune checkpoints that we could perhaps um, have as new and innovative therapies in future. Next slide, please. So I realize that this has been a huge amount to absorb and of course the experiments are extremely complicated, but I'd like to end here and really highlight some of the areas which we feel are important and where further research is needed too. So, First of all, although you heard earlier that we have some highly effective um, FDA approved therapies for patients who have metastatic melanoma, these are not effective in all, all patients. And so it's very important, I think, to increase the um, amount of patients who were able to successfully treat. So to this end, we're extremely interested in coming up with a new series of therapeutic options. Um, the reason I showed you some of the experiments of the, um, the um, mice who had the metastases in the brain is this is another key area where improved therapies are needed. As you can probably appreciate from all the, the, the complicated experiments, we have a lot happening here. We have cells interacting with tumor cells and immune cells and trying to understand all of this is a challenge. And so here we feel that new and improved analysis approaches, including things such as AI will really help us to actually extract as much as possible out of these complicated experiments. And finally, our other focus here is on some of the rarer subtypes of melanoma. So there's been enormous progress in in treating patients who have cutaneous melanomas on sun exposed skin there are also melanomas which can arise in the eye on the soles of of the feet and in pediatric patients for which we've made very little progress and so for us these are some of the key areas of need and i will stop here and thank you for your attention and thank you, Kieran. A great presentation. We're going to take questions at the end, but there's one point I just want to have you clarify. You showed a lot of testing and how it could be used to select um, treatment. Today, if we're treating a patient at Moffitt, 
Are we using this technology of one cell at a time to make any decisions? Not at all, no. All of this, I think, will be incredibly important in future, except at the moment, this is purely in the research arena. So we still got a little ways to go to translate this to the individual patient. Great. Well, um, we wanted to make sure we talk about the whole spectrum of skin cancers today. And so who better to uh, talk to us about that but my another one of my colleagues, Dr. Ken Tsai. He is a true triple threat. He's a dermatologist who sees patients in the uh, cutaneous clinic here on Fridays. He's a pathologist who is looking at uh, biopsies and sentinel nodes and uh, melanoma excisions, and he is a researcher, the vice chair of the entire Department of Pathology for Research, and the co-director of the uh, of our Melanoma and Skin Cancer Center of Excellence, with a special focus on skin cancer research. So, Ken, tell us about the latest here. Great. Thank you for that introduction, Vern. Great to be here this evening with you all. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, skin carcinomas. So these are uh, in total uh, more common than uh, melanoma, and they arise from the uppermost layer of the skin, which is the epidermis here. You can see that in the, these are the little purple cells that you see sort of in the middle of that diagram. And today I'm going to talk to you mostly about squamous cell carcinomas, which are diagnosed over a million times a year. So very, very common. Um, and um, a small percentage of these squamous cell carcinomas can become aggressive and cause uh, problems in terms of uh, metastatic disease and uh, locally advanced aggressive disease. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Merkel cell carcinoma, which is uh, also aggressive, but very rare, diagnosed probably about 2,500 to 3,000 times a year, uh, a year uh, in the United States, um, but which uh, with which we have a, a especially deep experience, both clinically and uh, in the realm of research here at Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, next slide, please. So just to put this all into context, skin carcinomas are the most common cancers uh, in humans. So I've carved out the big pie on the left, all skin cancers, around the ballpark of five to six million diagnoses a year uh, in the United States. And about a fifth of those, I said before, about a million uh, are cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas. Now, if we translate, go to the right, the, the, the circle on the right. So the proportion of squamous cell carcinomas that turn out to be aggressive is probably about 5%, we think. 50,000 cases a year that end up being very aggressive. They, they start to involve large areas of the skin around the original tumor and or they metastasize to usually to um, uh, draining lymph nodes. So that red part of the pie on the right there, aggressive squamous cell carcinoma, that's about 50,000 cases. We put that in the context of that uh, with almost 100,000 new diagnoses of melanoma a year. That's the yellow. And then the thin green sliver is Merkel cell carcinoma, as I mentioned to you, by far the rarest of the, of the carcinomas that we're going to be discussing today. Next slide. So squamous cell carcinoma is interesting because it goes through what we call a precancerous intermediate. That's the sort of the middle column right there. We call that the actinic keratosis. And many of you may have um, may have experienced with this. These are the sort of scaly spots that you find on sun exposed areas of your skin, the backs of the hands, the cheeks, the forehead, the scalp, the ears. Um, these are these small scaly um, uh, patches. Uh, we often destroy them with uh, liquid nitrogen spray or um, you know have uh, patients use a uh, chemotherapy cream like Effudex on them. And we destroy them because uh, um, a small proportion of them can develop into invasive squamous cell carcinoma, which is what you see on the right here. So these top pictures here are obviously pictures of the skin, the backs um, of someone's hand with actinic keratosis and then invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And on the bottom row, you can see the corresponding micrographs under the microscope, a biopsy of normal skin on the left 
And then what happens to it when it gets irradiated, you see that dermis turn into that gray material uh, on the skin. You can see that often gives uh, skin a yellowish grayish tinge. And that's something we call uh, uh, solar elastosis. And then on the right, this is what an invasive squamous cell carcinoma looks like under the microscope. You can see these um, large, pale, uh, unusual looking cells as they uh, invade into the deeper layers of the skin. Next slide, please. One of the most interesting things that's come about recently is our discovery that, um, that in fact, if you look at sun damaged skin, so this is the skin that doesn't have a lesion on it, no actinic keratosis on it, but has evidence of chronic sun exposure. If you actually take a look at the skin there, you can find that the DNA dam the, there's extensive DNA damage that's been uh, present as a result of exposure to the skin. So I'm showing, uh, sorry, as a result of exposure to the sun. So if you look at the top row here, that's actually a portion of skin that come, came out of a cosmetic procedure, to a, sort of an eyelid lift that was done. And what these investigators did uh, was that they punched little holes in it. They took the pieces of skin out from there uh, and they sequenced it very, very deeply. And what they found were that genes involved in uh, the progression of uh, and development of squamous cell carcinoma were found to be mutated in these areas of otherwise normal appearing skin. So genes like P53 and FAT1, you can actually then draw a diagram. These circles S are give you an estimate of how large these abnormal keratinocyte clones um, uh, have expanded in otherwise normal appearing skin. And so all of these colored circles here represents a small potential cancer, potentially on its way to, to becoming a actinic keratosis or squamous cell carcinoma. And this is a very interesting, this paper really changed the way we think about how skin cancers and indeed you can make these observations and other uh, other epidermal surfaces the esophagus the oral cavity um, the gi tract you can find evidence of these sorts of mutations developing uh, in areas of these epidermal and um, mucosal surfaces that reflect uh DNA damage and insults coming from the environment, which may predispose the cancer. One of the things that we're very interested in doing now is, is seeing whether we can sample normal appearing skin that's been sun damaged and actually use the presence or absence of these DNA mutations to predict uh, future risk of developing cancer. Next slide. Uh, the other carcinoma that I wanted to discuss today was Merkel cell carcinoma. This is actually, again, very, uh, very rare carcinoma. We have a lot of experience in it, and it's worth knowing about because it can uh, behave aggressively. The biggest problem with Merkel cell carcinoma is that it often looks like that lesion on the left, sort of this nondescript bump, a little bit reddish in appearance, often misdiagnosed as a boil or a vascular lesion. It can have, of course, much more dramatic uh, presentations. Uh, for example, on the right, that's a crop of very locally aggressive uh, Merkel cell carcinoma that's developed on a patient's leg. Next slide, please. And we've tried to come up with... Uh, next slide, please. I don't know if that's advancing. Ah, perfect. So uh, we've tried to develop a, a, um, a little cheat sheet here of clinical features that are associated with Merkel cell carcinoma. Unfortunately, they tend to be asymptomatic, but they often are reported to expand quite rapidly. Very rapid growth noted over, you know, a, a several week to month period. People who are immunosuppressed because they may have received organ transplants or or, um, or on other uh, medications to suppress the immune system are at higher risk. A Merkel cell carcinoma uh, has a strong um, relationship with uh, age, very much often uh, occurring uh, in a greater proportion in older individuals you know, with peak incidence in the seventh and eighth decades. Um, and then um, there is a, a predilection for uh, uh, Merkel cell carcinoma to arise uh, 
in ultraviolet radiation exposed areas, so UV exposed areas, as well as um, in uh, people who are fair complected, so light light skinned individuals. Um, next slide, please. One of the things that's very interesting about Merkel cell carcinoma is that there are actually two causes that we're uh, aware of. On the right, uh, Merkel cell polyoma virus is actually a virus that uh, lives on uh, our skin. It's a commensal, uh, but uh, if you have two um, very unlikely events, the Merkel cell polyoma virus uh, acquires a mutation and it manages to enter a cell in your skin and become integrated into the genome. It can then elaborate two viral oncoproteins, large T and small T antigens, and this, this results in the formation uh, of a tumor. In a minority of cases, about 40% uh, of the time, um, uh, UV-mediated DNA damage, just as one observes in uh, squamous cell carcinoma and uh, melanoma, uh, can cause uh, the right combination of DNA damage uh, in the right genes uh, to cause the development of Merkel cell carcinoma. So, a very, very interesting um, carcinoma from this perspective in that there are two distinct causes that appear to give rise to the same cancer. Uh, next slide. As you uh, well know, uh, many uh, unresectable or uh, cancers, uh, skin cancers that can't be removed uh, uh, entirely by surgery or those that are widely metastatic uh, do often respond to immunotherapy. Uh, the most successful and extensively tested of these immunotherapies essentially take the brakes off the immune system. They engage uh, inhibitory signals on T cells that are part of the normal function of the immune system. In other words, it's the way in which the immune system turns itself off, and these drugs actually turn the immune system back on uh, and, uh, and can actually result in very, very dramatic responses uh, in skin cancers as a, as a group. Uh, next slide. So uh, I'm gonna uh, end up with two uh, areas, I think of very, very active, uh, both clinical and research investigation that I think has really direct uh, impact on how we treat and how we think about treating uh, skin cancers. Um, the first uh, is this promise of neoadjuvant uh, therapy. And the concept here basically is that if you look on the left here, you've got a skin tumor, right? You've got that tumor in the skin, the primary site, and then you've got uh, um, um, a, metast a metastatic deposit here in the lymph node uh, on, the, on the bottom left here. And the idea is that uh, in, a, in a case where you might have advanced disease or or um, uh, even uh, in a uh, borderline uh, resectable uh, uh, setting. In other words, uh, you might be on the edge of, of, of being able to be successfully treated by a surgery, which can be potentially quite large and, and, and involve a lot of um, um, uh, recovery time. Uh, what, what I think uh, both our experience in melanoma and skin carcinomas has taught us is that there's great promise in the in the what we call the neoadjuvant approach. And that is to say that we shrink these tumors by using a shorter course of immunotherapy. We shrink the tumor down, then uh, uh, surgery is performed, and uh, hopefully we um, are, are then able to um, perform a smaller surgery, uh, potentially, but also uh, potentially cure uh, uh, that disease. Uh, there's a counterpart to neoadjuvant therapy, which is adjuvant therapy, which is that you give the immunotherapy after the surgery and uh, uh, in the absence of evident uh, disease. And so both of these modalities, neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy, can also be combined. And we think um, represents a really... Uh, um, promising uh, uh, therapeutic approach in, in both melanoma as well as skin carcinomas. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is, is, is a new uh, technology. It's been in the research realm for, for quite some time, but now is, I think, coming into clinical practice in a way that um, is potentially quite, um, quite exciting. 
And this is the idea that um, tumors often shed their DNA into the circulation. Uh, so if you know what mutations are present in the tumor, you can actually pick up evidence of mutated DNA coming from those tumors in the blood. And so it turns out that if you um, remove a, a tumor surgically and you think you've removed all of it, you can then actually do a CT DNA test. And this is a chart showing um, uh, uh, basically a group of, uh, of patients that um, uh, were uh, disease-free by all criteria. They had surgery, they had definitive surgery, um, and, and did not have um, any evidence uh, on radiology of, of, of remaining disease. And they had um, a CT DNA test done. And in the blue curve are patients that had a negative CT DNA result, which is to say they had no evidence of tumor DNA circulating in the blood. And in the red uh, are, are patients that had uh, a positive CT DNA test. In other words, evidence that they had tumor DNA uh, in their blood after their definitive treatment. And what you can see here is that over time, uh, a period of 30 to 60 days, you'll, you can see here on the graph, um, that individuals that had a positive CT DNA test uh, after their therapy um, had a dramatically elevated risk of recurrence um, uh, following that um, positive test. And those that had negative CT DNA test in, had an extremely low a risk of recurrence after that. Um, and so now the research is centered around whether or not, not only can we detect disease that is not um, clinically or radiographically detectable, but can we actually um, uh, also use this test as a way of determining the efficacy of immunotherapy and uh, whether or not, um, for example, someone should be treated with adjuvant therapy. So, I'm going to close there. Um, we're happy to take any questions, but I uh, hope that I've given you a little bit of a flavor of uh, the uh, universe of skin carcinomas and where uh, some of our most uh, recent uh, research and clinical uh, efforts have led us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ken. That was great. Um, let's see if I can get, there we go. Um, I am going to uh, take a quick pause before we do the question and answer session to introduce Mark Ketterer, uh, who is our uh, contact with the Moffitt Foundation. He is, helps work specifically with the cutaneous program. He's quite familiar with our efforts and what we're trying to do. And uh, so if you have any questions about how you might want to support the research that we're doing, uh, please, there's his contact information and get in touch with him. Mark, you want to say just a few words? Sure. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us this evening for this insightful look into the cutaneous department's work at Moffitt. Um, I am Mark Hedder. I work exclusively with the cutaneous department in their fundraising efforts, and it's truly an honor and a privilege to work with the likes of Dr. Sondak, Smalley, and Sai. Um, and it's important to remember that these experts don't just benefit the local patients, but they're also having a global impact uh, in our communities. Uh, like all Herculean tasks, such as curing cancer, it does take a team and philanthropic supporters, like many of you on this, are, play a key role in that. Um, as you might have heard, Moffitt's cutaneous oncology department is engaged in key research projects that could be advanced even further by philanthropic support. So if you would like to make a gift uh, to support the prevention and cure of skin cancer at Moffitt, please reach out to me to discuss your interests and how we can make an impact on patients today and in the future. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the question and answer. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, a few of the questions, I'll start with you, Ken, uh, had to do even before you started talking about Thanks. circulating tumor DNA uh, testing was about how do we tell if the cancer is coming back when the patient feels totally normal, feels fine. Is ctDNA available today for every kind of uh, skin cancer? And how often do we use it if it is available? And why don't we use it on everybody? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think, um, you know, 
I would say within the realm of, you know, skin cancers, this has probably been looked at most uh, closely in melanoma and Merkel cell carcinoma. And, you know, if you look at cancers as a whole, not all cancers are what we call good shedders. In other words, they don't necessarily shed their, um, you know, tumor DNA at all at the same rate. So it's not clear right now whether or not CT DNA represents um, uh, equally good information across all cancers. I, I would say the context in, in which um, I've seen it used most is is um, following individuals um, that we think have no uh, uh, evidence of, of disease and for whom their disease was not high risk enough to justify um, routine use of adjuvant therapy. So someone that might have had a very small lesion, you know, and is, you know, un either um, unable to or, or really wouldn't be, wouldn't have the appropriate indication to have routine radiographic, you know, like a scan every three or six months. You know, we do um, routinely follow some some of those individuals using a CT DNA test uh, long term with the idea that we might be able to detect a recurrence earlier than any other um, uh, modality. But I guess the take home message at this point is that, you know, we haven't characterized the relationship between um, tumor size and um levels of CT DNA for all tumor types yet. The second thing is it's it's still unclear whether or not if you detected a rising CT DNA level, um, how much time um, that would give you before detecting the same disease recurrence radiographically. So if the disease lead time were let's say 30 to 60 days, which is where we think it is for Merkel cell carcinoma, um, it's not clear that that's true for everybody, and it's not clear whether or not, maybe more importantly, not clear whether um, intervening at that point um, would actually make a difference. And I and I think that's where um, the utility of having very well planned um, prospective trials, where the CT DNA assessments are built in to the design of the trial is really important. I would say that to my knowledge, I think the, the leading efforts in cancer, you know, as a whole probably is in, is in colon cancer. Those trials have been very sophisticated in the way they've built in measuring CT DNA uh, for the purposes of driving therapeutic decisions. But we're not quite there yet for skin cancers. Exactly how, how I would phrase it. The colon cancer studies, huge, large studies, um, and took years to establish that, yes, you could make some decisions in colon cancer based on the DNA. Now, they had a long history of using CEA blood tests, and so this wasn't a big change. This was an incremental change. I remember talking to one of my colleagues in another center who does a lot of Merkel cell testing and was really excited about the blood test. And he said, oh, I got a case and and the blood test was positive. So I went to call him up and tell him, come in for a scan. And they said, oh, I was just going to call you. I felt a lump. So the blood test didn't give that patient any new information that they didn't already have. The other problem we sometimes have is what if the blood test is positive and we do a test and we can't do a CAT scan and we can't find anything. We're not ready to start treating based on these tests because they're not accurate enough yet. But there's just enough promise to this to really give us uh, a sense that, that this may be a direction we can go in the future. All right, I want to go into a few other uh, exciting topics. I do want to make one announcement. One of the main areas we didn't talk about today that is still very active in the cutaneous clinic is cutaneous lymphomas, things like mycosis fungoides, Sejury syndrome, CTCL, we call it. We're, we promise we're going to have a, one of these um, webinars within the next year or so totally devoted to 
CTCL. It's just such a big topic. We couldn't fit all of that in today, but there's a lot of research going on there as well. Now, Dr. Small, I want to clarify some, some things here. Got a question or two about this. You talked about the differences in what we've, in the progress we've made with um, regular, we'll call it melanomas on the skin versus some of the others, mucosal and others. Um, I take it you're not saying we haven't made any progress. Tell us what's the difference in the kinds of progress we've made between uh, uh, those rarer types and where do we still have to get more information through research? Okay, well, that is a great question. So um, I think um, the reason there hasn't been as much research into things like mucosal and acral melanoma historically is because they are incredibly rare um, in comparison. And so obviously you start with where the the largest kind of a problem is, I guess. Um, there has been progress, I think, in all of these things. I mean, certainly... Um, the immunotherapies which are approved for treating the regular cutaneous melanoma also have efficacy in some of the rarer forms as well including acral and mucosal i think um there are kind of two issues um and as far as the mucosal is concerned i think some of the therapies which are fda approved for metastatic melanoma are effective in mucosal, but there hasn't been anything, I would say, mucosal specific as yet. There are certainly people who are working on this at the moment. And then because these cancers are rarer, um, I think these patients haven't been included as much in the ongoing clinical trials. So I think those are two areas which have to be addressed in future. Yep, I think you've said it perfectly. We've seen progress, but we're not at that 60 or 70 percent level like we're seeing in some of these bigger studies in melanoma. Now, somebody asked a really tough question. So how many years is it going to take us to get to 80 percent? Uh, is that two years, three years away? Is it five years away? And the answer is we really don't know. Each time we raise that bar, just like with the high jump in the uh, pole vault, you say, how many years is this world record going to stand? Is it going to go down at the next Olympics or is it going to take 10 years before somebody can go jump any higher than this guy just jumped? We don't know the answer to that, but we know what's created the progress that we've gotten uh, here. It's been the combination of research in the laboratory and translating that research into clinical trials. It's not like we could just take something right out of a test tube, give it to a patient and say, oh, we're done. The process of actually getting these discoveries turned into drugs that the FDA will approve and your insurance company will pay for is a long, complex process and, uh, and one that fortunately has been quite successful in melanoma. All right. Um, how about uh, talking, we, we've talked a lot about immunotherapy. Talk just a little bit here and about uh, where we are today with using BRAF targeted therapies like uh, um, dibrafenib, trametinib, and encobini, and I'll share some of my thoughts as well. Okay, well, I uh, have to have a plug here for the, for the, the BRAF inhibitors because this was always... The thing I was really personally um, interested in. Um, I will say that um, at least in the short term, the BRAF plus MEK inhibitor combination is extraordinarily effective in patients who have a, a BRAF mutation. I will also say the effects are more durable than perhaps everybody had first thought as well. So there are patients who are like five years out who haven't um, failed at all on the BRAF inhibitor therapy, which I think is highly impressive. Um, 
I think really uh, the other thing which is um, interesting about this is there are clearly groups of patients who will actually respond extremely favorably here. And I think this again is an interesting research question is trying to understand why we have a group of patients who have a BRAF mutation who will actually respond for a really long time and others who are not. And I'm not sure that's really been entirely answered yet. Um, I think what is also clear though, is that um, um, it's certainly true that the order of the th therapy sequencing is important. There have been several trials um, which have shown um, it's usually a smarter idea to actually use immunotherapy first and switch to the BRAF inhibitor therapies in future, as opposed to having the BRAF plus MEK inhibitor in the front line. And I'll stop there. And that's, to be clear, in stage four melanoma, we did several large studies and just asked the question, if we flip a coin, heads, you get the BRAF treatment first, tails, you get uh, immunotherapy first. It looked like it was a better strategy in metastatic disease in patients who never had any previous treatment to use immunotherapy first. Why? Probably because the BRAF treatment worked better if the immunotherapy didn't work than the immunotherapy worked if the BRAF targeted therapy didn't work. They both worked well at the beginning, but it was which one could work better when the chips were down. And it looks like in that situation, um, perhaps immunotherapy first, targeted therapy second has an advantage. When we've got stage three melanoma patients and we're giving the treatment to prevent the cancer from coming back, it's much less clear and we don't have good uh, research data to steer us one way or another. And both of them are very good strategies. Boy, there's so many um, questions. There, there's several, uh, uh, a whole number of questions that were about multiple melanomas. Why do we get multiple melanomas? Uh, what does it mean? What research is going on with multiple melanomas? Ken, why do we get more than one melanoma? And, and is it genetic? Is it, what, what is the problem there? Um, certainly there are um, individuals with um what we think is a, um, a predisposition to developing melanomas. Um, you know, there are very, very dramatic um, examples of this with um, uh, familial uh, syndromes where uh, individuals can have uh, a mutation that they've inherited through the germ line from parents and their pedigrees where there's very, very um, high incidence of melanomas at an early age within families, as well as a predisposition to other cancers, uh, for example, of the pancreas. Um, uh, and so th these are often very, very um, uh, dramatic presentations of inheritable, a heritable predisposition to uh, melanoma and uh, other cancers. Um, there are probably um, uh, much less dramatic examples uh, of of these as well. Um, so certainly family history is um, an, a risk factor. But in terms of um, does having a melanoma elevate your risk of having a second one, it certainly does. Um, oftentimes, uh, um, uh, initial diagnosis of, of melanoma will um, increase your your risk of developing a, a second one. Um, and that detection of the second melanoma um, often occurs within the first two to three years of the initial diagnosis. Um, and so part of that is, of course, driven by the fact that once you've had a melanoma, you're probably more likely to be more vigilant about getting your skin checked and looking at it. But but it's, it, it is, appears to be the case that once you've had uh, one, you've developed, uh, you have a higher likelihood of developing uh, another. Obviously, some of this can be related to environmental uh, exposure. So, you know, if you've acquired a certain amount of sun damage in your in your youth and 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 are at elevated risk because of that, then um, certainly it makes sense to to to, to think that you know 
uh, that you may be uh, at elevated risk for developing melanomas and perhaps other skin cancers um, because of your overall exposure. And that, you know, could certainly happen in another area of your skin. The sun doesn't shine on just one spot on your skin. Oh. And that's a big part of the problem and a big reason why patients need to be followed very closely, even if they're able to be cured by their of their first melanoma or other skin cancer. Well, it's hard to believe, but it's already seven o'clock. We've run out of time. I apologize if we didn't get to your specific question. We've been tr keeping track. We will try to get some information back to people where we can. Um, and we really appreciate all of your support and for being here with us tonight. We are, certainly hope you found it uh, both informational and inspirational that uh, even as we've made a lot of progress, no one here is, uh, uh, is taking any victory laps. We're continuing to push forward and hope that uh, we really can elevate that bar so high that we can all take a victory lap, doctors and patients together. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we're gonna keep doing these in the future. Uh, CTCL will probably be our next topic, so stay tuned, and we will. Um, you'll be hearing more from us. Thank you all for joining us, and a big thank you to our two expert discussants.